All this is Mubeen Sayed from Dr. from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. I hope you had a great long weekend. Let us start our discussion. We have a very interesting new vaccine type. The technologies are actually older, but the concept of vaccine applied in this way is new. So let's look at it. The this particular discussion is um, courtesy of Jim Walkers. He on Patreon suggested this topic. And I also wanted to especially thank El Jan Elderton and Avox as well for tremendous support and actually all Cool Beans for their support during this time. And I would discuss that later on. Okay, so this is the first wo world's first intradermal SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Very, very interesting concept. So let me just show you the the links first. So this is drbean.com. This is the news about it in nature. This, this is what uh, Jim had shared. India's DNA COVID vaccine is a world first. More are coming. Then this is the approval of this vaccine in India. So DBT by RAC supported Zykov D developed by Zydus Kadila receives emergency use authorization. This is August 20, 2021, when they got the EUA for this. This is another article about this. All of these links are in the description. This is a plasmid-based vaccine, and I'm going to go through that. They use this te technology. This technology is called PharmaJet. This is a needle-less injection, and that is the technology they use. So I'm going to discuss that as well. This is the phase one and two, although the approval is or authorization, emergency use authorization is granted on the basis of phase three. So we'll talk about that too. This is the Zykov COVID vaccine. I think this was the most elaborate um, article I could find. This is precisionvaccines.com. And then we will talk about plasmids so what is a plasmid? Again, here on the Wikipedia, if you'd like it to read from somewhere else, totally up to you. And now let's start a discussion. So first of all, the summary. So if you just want to see what this vaccine is. So vaccine's name is Zykov D. So then the type of vaccine, it's a DNA vaccine. The DNA, just like adenovirus is a DNA-based vaccine as well, but it has an adenovirus involved in the whole structure. Here, there is no adenovirus involved. So DNA-based vaccine, the, the vehicle that is carrying the gene is a plasmid. And I would explain that a little more here. It is a non-replicating, non-integrating plasmid. What that means is that the plasmid or the DNA material that will go into our nucleus will not integrate with our chromosome and will not make its copies. So it is not replicating and it is not integrating. The company that has made it is Indian company Zydus Kadila. So of course, there's a lot of uh, pride with that as well, that this is India's indigenously built vaccine. And this is the world's first vaccine of this type. Current state approved for late stage clinical trials. Plus it is of course now on 20th August, authorized for the uh, 12 plus years of age. It is given intradermally. So in the skin, it is injected with the PharmaJet technology. The doses and the schedule, it has three doses. They are given at 28 days apart. So that's about three months. To me, it seemed a lot to say, you know, the injection will be completed or the doses will be completed for three months, but hopefully that would work out for most of the people. The dose volume is three milligram per dose. Efficacy is 67%. So uh, if you look at Johnson & Johnson, which is adenovirus based, that had a similar number for e e uh, efficacy. Here it is 67%, and I would explain why it is 67%, and why does it need three doses instead of two or one? It is protective at 67%, and the phase three trial that was done is 28,000 participants that were in it. Production 
in production possibly now so after 20th august it is actually in production now the details how is the technology itself so if you just wanted to hear the summary that is a summary you can quit here if you just wanted to know about this vaccine now what is the technology what is the detail of it how does it work i i really am fascinated by this you know that i get fascinated by these medical mechanisms so here is how it works this rounded structure is a plasmid plasmid are circular double strands of dnas found in nature mostly present in the bacteria so i have always called them superpowers of the bacteria and bacteria can actually share copies of these plasmids with each other on these plasmids there may be genes that help a bacteria become let's say antibiotic resistant and then what happens is those bacteria that have this plasmid in them that helps them become antibody antibiotic resistant they can make copies of it and give it to other bacteria so that is the interesting part of it the plasmid normally so if you look at the structure here this structure can be independent be replicating or expressing compared to the dna what does that mean imagine this plasmid is in my nucleus my nucleus has lot of my chromosome and genetic material in each cell correct so let's say we take one nucleus in one cell that nucleus is doing some gene expression based on what my cells functions are and so every so often some gene opens up just like a page in a book and the recipe is created into a messenger rna and then the function occurs if this plasmid is sitting in my nucleus as well then this plasmid is not going to care for how the cell is dividing it will not care when the cell is expressing its genes or not the plasmid would just independently make or express its genes so that is the structure of it some of the people have called it an episome an episome is a plasmid that comes from outside goes into a nucleus but normally episomes could be integrated with the dna as well so because of that calling this plasmid in an episome is not entirely accurate it does not integrate with our new chromosome now the other thing if you look at the structure the important things in here is that let's say this green part here this is the this is the gene or the complementary dna that makes the viral spike protein so it is still a spike protein game so the viral spike proteins dna is placed on this plasmid around that dna or piece of genetic material there are restriction units what that means is that when this plasmid would express when this book will be opened up to make a recipe from or read a recipe from it the there are there are um, binders or the end leaves that would allow only this part of the gene to be read and nothing else plus there always has to be a promoter a promoter is a part near a gene on which cellular machineries come and sit and then from there they'll start working on expressing the gene so it's a platform for the the cellular enzymes to sit down on and then those cranes and little machines will sit there and work on this gene to express that it's a beautiful process now this plasmid when it will be in our dna it will express this gene this dna and it will make messenger rna from it we'll see that a little more in detail later on but just realize that this company's invention is that they have taken the spike proteins gene from the sars cov 2 then they have created a complementary dna piece for that then they have created a plasmid on which this dna piece is attached or inserted as we call it then this little plasmid circular dna piece is ready to go into our cells 
and make spike protein messenger RNA. So let's look at that. So once the plasmid is created, these plasmids, these circular DNA materials are filled in this pharma jet. Pharma jet is a needleless injection, um, uh, what is that, equipment, some structure. <laughs> I, can, I cannot understand what to call it. So equipment for the time being. So what happens is we fill it with this DNA plasmids. Then what happens is if you look at my arm here, you inject it somewhere on the skin and it creates a jet of water or fluid. There is no needle in it. It creates a sharp jet of fluid. That fluid contains these plasmids as well. And that fluid will then go and accumulate in the skin or slightly below the skin as well, but mostly dermal, mostly in the skin. So that is the basic technology. It's a pharma jet technology. This technology is used to deliver other medicines and vaccines as well. It's not just for this, but it is interesting how this company used this technology with plasmid to create a vaccine. So here, if you see in this diagram, this part is skin, under the skin is fats, and then under that is the muscle. So when the pharma jet is used, it will inject the vaccine or these plasmids in the skin. Now the skin, just like other surfaces of our body, is rich in immune cells. We tend to gather immune cells at the boundaries of our body. And skin is, of course, a boundary. So there are lots of immune cells over there. So now what happens? If we go more in detail, if we take a microscope and land in that area of the skin where this injection has been given. So if you see here, these are the plasmids. So these little circular things are the circular DNA material plasmids. They are injected in the skin. Now this whole thing is happening in skin. And there are fibroblasts in there. There are keratinocytes, which make the skin cells. There are myocytes just under the skin is the muscle. Then there are lots of immune cells, for example, dendritic cells and macrophages, B cells, T cells, and many other neutrophils, uh, natural killer cells, and so on. So all of those cells are now surrounding this little cluster of plasmids. Interestingly, we do not need an adenovirus to bring the plasmid inside the cell. We also do not need any lipid nanoparticle to bring the plasmids inside the cell. Instead, these plasmids are phagocytosed by the immune cells. This is the function of the immune cells, the macrophages, the natural killer cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, B cells. What is their function? They will phagocytose. They will eat up the material that they think is foreign. So that would mean what? That will mean that this, and let me explain where my knowledge is not uh, complete yet for this particular vaccine. And I've been looking for it. I haven't gotten the answer yet. So let's say this is a macrophage. In this macrophage, when it would cyt phagocytose that plasmid, so let's say here is the phagocytose, these rounded things are plasmids or the vaccine. Phagocytose simply mean the cell has picked them up and created a tiny pocket and brought it inside. This pocket, you can call this as the cell's stomach. So the cell would make its stomachs as it picks up things from outside. Now, ideally what happens is we all know this part that this phagocytotic vacuole, this little purse, this little pocket will be fused with lysosomal, lysosomal vacuole. What is lysosomal vacuole? A lysosomal vacuole has enzymes in it that are digestive enzymes. And when they are connected, these two vacuoles, the digestive enzymes are spilled into the phagocytic vacuole and they would go and destroy it. Now, here is where my knowledge gap is. And I kept looking for it and I couldn't find it. So of course this is working. So there is a solution. I just do not know that part. And here's that gap. The gap is that normally when we fuse phagocytic material, 
with lysosomes, then the lysosomes are going to go and destroy this material. But we do not want these little plasmids to be destroyed. We want them to stay intact. And we want them to then end up inside the nucleus. So what protects them from getting destroyed after the phagocytosis? Or is it that, let's say, there are a million of them. I'm making up a number. Million of them, and then 900,000 are gotten destroyed. And then 100,000 were able to escape. And then they were able to enter the nucleus. This is the part I do not know. And I think, of course, the company that has done it, they know it. It's just that I could not find that mechanism somewhere. So I cannot speak about it until I read more about it. The eventual outcome is that these plasmids, after getting phagocytosed, entering the cell, then they are liberated in the cell, and then they enter our nucleus. So nucleus of a macrophage, nucleus of a monocyte, nucleus of a natural killer cell, a dendritic cell, a keratinocyte, a myocyte, a fibroblast, and other cells. So it enters there. Once this is inside the nucleus, over there, I think we have done this discussion before as well. Now the regular normal process, imagine the adenovirus-based vaccine and the remaining function is similar, although the side effects are not similar to adenovirus-based vaccine because there is no adenovirus involved here. So that is one thing that that company says, that hey, our vaccine does not have an adenovirus involved. So any side effects related to adenovirus platform are not here. For example, we know that there are clotting issues in women under 50 years of age. So that these kind of side effects are not here. What are the side effects here? We do not know yet. We would see some more data. So now what is happening? Imagine this is that plasmid. This remaining part is just our own DNA sitting in there. The plasmid, once inside the nucleus, it will be transcribed. Transcribed means what? It will open up like a book. The recipe written here to make a spike protein, that recipe will be copied in the form of a messenger RNA. So we'll say it simply that a messenger RNA will be developed from the DNA of the spike protein that we have sent in the nucleus. Now that messenger RNA would then come out of the nucleus. This is very similar to the remaining, the, the adenovirus-based vaccines. So the messenger RNA would then come out. Then it will attach with the ribosome. Ribosomes are cellular machinery sitting in our cytoplasm. That would take the messenger RNA and convert that into a protein. That is the function. That is the process called translation. So the translation will occur. This messenger RNA would work with ribosome to give rise to spike proteins. These spike proteins would enter endosomes and will be broken up into smaller pieces loaded on MHC2. This is the antigen presenting cell we are talking about. Antigen presenting cells normally present things on MHC2. They can do it on MHC1 as well, but they would do it on MHC2 in addition because they want to activate the immune system. So either on MHC2 or on MHC1, for example, if it is a keratinocyte, a keratinocyte does not present antigens on MHC2. It presents them on MHC1 because it's a re regular civilian cell. So whichever it is, MHC2 or 1. So if you see on this side, here, now the immune system will become activated. And we have looked at this multiple times, how the immune system becomes active. This is a naive T cell that will come in contact with this macrophage. Now, this all is happening mostly in the skin. There is a possibility that some of these macrophages will pick up this, this vaccine and run to a lymph node and present it to the cells in the lymph node as well. So this function is going to happen in the local lymph nodes and at the site of injection as well. So here we have T helper cell, zero, naive T cell, doesn't know the purpose of its life. And then if we have interleukin-4 available and not interleukin-12, then the T helper zero will become T helper one. T helper one would release interleukin four and five and six and 10 and so on. And important thing is four and five will help activate B cells. B cells, once they become active, they are called plasma cells. Plasma cells will make antibodies and we will get antibodies to start helping us. Plus, more importantly, 
the immune system has become trained because we will make memory cells from these cells as well. Now, if on this side, if the naive T cell has interleukin-12 available, which normally is secreted by the macrophages, and the interleukin-4 is not there, then the naive T cell will convert into T helper 1 cell. Did I write it the other way around? So yes. So here, my apologies, this should have been T helper 2, and this should have been T helper 1. So T helper 1 pathway is engaged. And this pathway would then, there will be interleukin-12 released by T helper 1 cells. Interleukin-12, I said 12, interleukin-2 will then activate the cytotoxic T cells. We know that cytotoxic T cells have perforins with which they make holes in the infected cells. And then they have granzymes that they throw. These are also proteins that are thrown in the infected cells and they are killed. So short of this all is, cytotoxic T cell will become active as well. Now, it is possible that the both arms are activated, but the percentage of activation is different. The end result is we have created memory cells. So there are memory B cells that are sleeping. So they don't really sleep. I use this term more, you know, with some levity here. They're not really sleeping. Active cells are killed after some times, some copies are kept at the area of injection in the local lymph nodes, and it is possible that some of them would go in the bone marrow and live there, which will be called bone marrow plasma cells. These are less active, less in number B cells or memory cells, which when a future exposure with the same antigen will occur, they will become activated. And what does activation will mean? That is their number of cells would increase again because the cells would say, all right, the time to fight again. The antigen that that virus has attacked us once more. They'll increase in number, they'll become active and they would attack and they would protect us. This one here are the T cells and their memory cells. So once again, if, if the infection occurs again, then T cells and T cells have their own T cell receptors. They are sitting with those receptors and they're also looking for the antigens. When the antigens are present and they bind with the T cell receptors, T cells would also start becoming differentiated. They will proliferate first, that means increase in number, then they would differentiate or become even more specific and that is how they would act. So this is the structure and the function of this uh, vaccine. Now question is that why is the efficacy lower, about 67%? And I think they do not know. So the answer is still not known that what is the reason for lower efficacy. And remember, they also have three doses instead of two or one doses. So with the three doses, the efficacy is still low. And that may be this, the, this uh, phenomena that I discussed that may be something to do with this, to get enough plasmids in the nucleus to have them make enough spike protein to cause enough of immune system straining and to generate enough of the cells. So possibly when these plasmids are picked up by the immune system, majority of them are destroyed. This is my conjecture here to try to understand why efficacy is low and why even after three doses. So possibly the plasmids are picked up and they are phagocytosed and then they're destroyed. So majority of them are just simply destroyed. They don't get a chance to get into the nucleus and do their function. So whatever little amount is left, that is what goes to the nucleus. And then that is what makes the RNA. And I would have one more conjecture and that is those plasmids that are released here in the cytoplasm, those that escape the jail where they were going to be destroyed, not, it's not necessary that they would all end up in a nucleus. There is no um, restriction within the cell to say, don't destroy them. They are our guests who need to go to the nucleus. So it is possible that a majority of them are destroyed in the phagosome, lysosome. Then the ones that are liberated, some of them are destroyed in the cytoplasm. And then a tinier amount ends up in the nucleus. And that makes, of course, a smaller amount of messenger RNA, which means lesser amount of spike protein, which means less 
immune response. That is one possibility. Other possibility may be that the adjuvants present in this vaccine may not be as strong to trigger the immune system badly or severely enough to cause a severe response. And but I'm using the word severe here more liberally to say a stronger response. So maybe it is the adjuvant. Maybe it is a combination of this. Maybe it is something else that I do not know. But this is possibly is the mechanism. So the other thing that I do not know about this vaccine is the price of this yet. So I do not know exactly what is the price. It is an interesting um, vaccine in terms of the the route of administration, there is no needle involved, there is no blood vessel uh, injury involved, there is no nerve injury involved, there is no shoulder joint injury involved. It is a vaccine given by pressing it onto the skin and it just injects it with the fluid jet into the skin, into the skin. And the immune cells are activated in the skin. So that is the interesting part of it. So thank you very much for listening in. Um, John Snyder says, AstraZeneca is 67% against Delta. So yes, the adenovirus-based vaccines, Johnson & Johnson has a lower um, efficacy as well. So this is kind of at par with them. The interesting question is three doses, but still, this is a very interesting technique. Okay, so let's do this. If you are comfortable, we would now hang up and then come back up for a uh, discussion, a quick chit chat. Barbara says, would this be quite effective as a booster? However, perhaps it would be more gentle on our immune system. It seems to be more gentle on the immune system. You're correct. Um, as a booster, I would say it would be fine because at the end of the day, it is also making a spike protein. Whatever is the mechanism, eventually what it is doing is making antigens of the spike protein. <laughs> right here is Kyrie, uh, and she's standing next to the chair and just doing this. Okay, so uh, Bar Barbara, yes, you are correct. So Meg says, why isn't anyone talking about having COVID equals natural immunity? Meg, we have actually spoken about this many times. We have even discussed the studies that show that having COVID induces natural immunity, which may be actually robust and lifelong as well. I've discussed those studies. <laughs> Janet says, naive T cells look content though. Yeah, they, they're like, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Susan says, the blue guy looks like a snorer. Yes. So it is the Kyrie over here. Moorhouse says, I didn't think 67 is necessary. Absolutely. So the we know that the bar was set as 60. So any F efficacy above 60% was acceptable. So it is in the acceptable range. CLK says, so how are the B memory or the T memory cells detected? So we know that there is a T detect cell that can detect the T cells that are memory cell. And it's a very simple thing. What you do is you take somebody's blood. Normally, these guys, some of them are circulating in the blood as well. They're just patrolling the system. So imagine you take somebody's blood and you put some antigen on them. So you take blood and you introduce, let's say, spike protein. If there are reacting cells to spike protein, that means the memory cells, if the person doesn't have the acute infection, then those cells would pick up spike protein and become active. And as soon as they become active, we can detect them to become active and we'll say, yes, there are memory cells. Michael Paulson says, Dr. Bean makes this incredibly easy to understand if a graduate from the University of Google won't understand lash out. There are actually people, not just the Google, who are who are on a campaign to reach out to every department to say, I'm a fake doctor. So there, there is more than just the Google now. 
Janet is saying I'm having to resubscribe to all of my. Okay, cool. So let's do this. Let us break for now from this one so that it stays smaller in size, this discussion. And then we do one more discussion separately. So yes, <laughs> reminder, do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to support this work, there is a Patreon link in the description. There is a link to use PayPal. There is a link to buy me a coffee as well. Nowadays, of course, there are many, many patrons who have been paying uh, and sending fee to for the, the lawyers. Unfortunately, it had to come to that as well. So uh, thank you to everyone for your support. And I would see you in a few minutes.